Friends, welcome everyone. Thanks for coming, despite the nice weather and the fact that it's still August. Um, it's my pleasure today to introduce Alessandro Boson, um, who is a prof at TU Delft. He got his PhD from uh, Politecnico or yes. Politecnico di Milano, right, in Italy. Uh, Alessandro is someone we meet all the time at the World Wide Web conference and related conferences, and finally. He decided, you know, to drop by Fribourg to, uh, to pay us a visit. So thanks a lot for dropping by, Alessandro. And his talk today will be towards diversity-aware social data management. Thank you, Philip, and thank thank you for inviting me here. It's a pleasure, and thank you all for being here today. Um, so uh, today's talk is organized more or less like an overview of the research activities that we do in Delft, hmm, in my in my group. Uh, I have a specific angle, so I like to study what I call, what I call social data, mm, that's why. Uh, and I have a specific way of doing this research. So I really like uh, personally, uh, also because of my background, I'm also an engineer, uh, to, to you know, play out, to do experimental work, to, to do things on the field, mm, outside of the lab. And so we have uh, many experiments going on, and I also like to use uh, those experiments uh, and those uh, use cases as a strong driver to, to lead the research, to give uh, really solid grounding uh, to what we do in order to make sure that uh, there is, a, uh, of course, an application, but also that what we do is falsi falsifiable on the field, that, you know, that it's actually correct. And this is specifically important with uh, social data. Now, so that's, that's where I am. I'm an assistant professor in Delft. Uh, I also have a Strange faculty fellow position in, uh, in IBM Benelux, uh, so I collaborate with them in a series of projects. And I also am a, a, um, an investigator in uh, what is called, uh, it's a mouthful, Amsterdam Advanced Metropolitan Solution Institute. It's a new institute that we set up uh, uh, with MIT and other universities in Amsterdam for urban studies. Uh, that's more or less about me and where I publish. Um, the work I do, of course, I don't do alone. I have uh, a really nice team of people that uh, support me, PhDs, postdoc, uh, and programmers, a master student. And together with them, we are working on the, the set of topics that I'm telling you now. I want this to be really interactive. Since I'm talking about what I'm doing, every time you want to have more details, please just ask. Huh? So it's not really a lecture, it was more a conversation I would like that to be. So. What's the focus? It's big data. I'm not going to bore you with Vs, uh, many Vs or whatever. We know what, what they are. They are important. They are there to stay. They can create uh, societal, uh, economical value. So they are worthy to study. And that's what we do, right? Especially here, you guys at the Exascale Lab. Uh, but what I like to study and what I would like to reflect upon is a specific type of data, uh, what I call social data. So data that are... Uh, somehow a direct uh, or indirect byproduct of people activities. Those are data that are produced directly by people, and you can imagine social media, but also indirectly because of what they do in the real world through sensors, mobile phone networks, uh, uh, and others. And together, these data provide uh, the biggest man-made uh, reflection of the world. We use this data to study the world, how people behave, how processes going on in environments like cities, enterprises, also online, of course. Uh, but when we look at this data through these spectacles, through these lenses, we now need to take into account a particular aspects that characterize them, that is the fact that they are produced by people. And because of that, they also bring uh, biases, uh, uh, well, new challenges that actually arise from this human uh, 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 nature of the data. So. These data are nuanced by culture, the by context, uh, technology penetration. Um, they are inconsistent, ambiguous. Of you know all the problem. And uh, this is the, f the, the focus of my research. Uh, and this is what I think is actually uh, important when you deal with the, this type of data. So traditionally, when we talk about big data, we talk about computation, right? So since the size uh, is a lot, uh, then we need to develop new methods to, to cope with the scale and to cope with uh, the, the huge amount of data that comes in. I think we maybe you're familiar with this graph. Uh, it's a classical one. But uh, in many circumstances, it's not really about uh, 
The problem is not really about processing the amount of data, but more getting the right data to understand the one that actually are good for the application that we have in mind, and also understand the properties of such data that makes them uh, uh, suitable for the purpose. So s many times blind adoption of big data or data-driven decisions are just wrong because they don't take into account why and how the data has been produced. So this is why they're combined with the fact that we are observing arrays of many fields that to somehow acknowledge the importance of the human component uh, into data creation, processing, and sense making, I believe that uh, the, uh, the, the, the evolution that you're looking for in order to really make a, a knowledgeable and actionable use of big data is to combine those two powerful computational units. So the machine one and the, and the human one into what I call hybrid computation. <coughs> so the two entities together. Now, it's not only a computational thing, it's actually a little bit uh, more. So when we handle, in my opinion is that when we handle social data, uh, this particular type of data asks for fundamentally different scientific approaches. So as uh, computational power is not the main issue, uh, the synergy that exists between technology and humans uh, somehow ask us as scientists and the engineers to combine our efforts to develop new fundamental uh, but also empirical advances is to understand the utility of the technology really need uh, to get to the bottom of it and how human and machines connect as a whole and how they create this social technical system can be the interpretation key that allow us to make sense of what we observe in the data uh, so it's not really just about uh, the relationship between machine and data here but it's really about also the people and uh, in terms of a research question that i like to address the main one, okay, how the two, machine and people, can actually cooperate in solving computational problem, but also those two here on the sides. I just read them, uh, it's easier. So how can human-generated web data be transformed into a source that inform web design, web system design? So how can we can make sense of data in order to create better systems? Uh, that's what we do. Uh, and also how can we uh, enhance those systems in order to enable large-scale hybrid computation? Uh, so to somehow take advantage of this those two synergies. This is pretty abstract, I understand, but they have a really concrete uh, way to tackle the problem. And uh, it is somehow summarized into this uh, schema, which is really uh, simple in a way. So you have uh, an information need, a data source, uh, you know, that calls for an information need, what you will call also a task in a way. On one hand, you have the crowd, the people, that are either the source uh, uh, of your data or potential computational units uh, or interpretation units and then you want to get the need uh, somehow dealt by the right crowd in the best possible way so the routing so those are the three components that i study the, the three main elements of my strategy so it's languages methods and tools for hybrid computation that goes also how to for instance design uh, uh, hybrid processes between crowds uh, and machines, uh, how can you optimize and control these assignments, how can you route uh, the right task to the right person. Mm? So th the fundamental is there is, is in the process and in the optimization. Then there is a, uh, a focus on the modeling, so how can you characterize and measure properties of tasks and people such that you can have that marriage uh, at the best. So which are the properties of tasks that are actually interesting uh, for these and which are the properties of people. So which is their skill, their expertise, uh, um, their motivation perhaps, what triggers them. Those are all important aspects you want to put in there. And to finalize, how can you make uh, all this process scalable and sustainable in the long term? So which type of motivations, which type of uh, um, uh, driver you can put in place in order to guarantee that the same level of scalability that you have uh, with machines, you can also achieve with humans, which of course it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, and so those are the three main components. And as I said, uh, I tackle this uh, uh, general problem. I try to, to, to do it uh, uh, driven by use cases. Uh, and I present you now three research problems that I'm working on. Uh, I do that by recency, meaning that uh, I will make the first, the one that is more, let's say, clear in my head because I'm working on it uh, I've been working on it until Sunday before coming here. And it is uh, social data for intelligent cities. So uh, I think you're all familiar with the, the broad uh, buzzword of uh, smart cities. 
right? So what, do, what does it imply? Uh, so, and the question they try to solve in there is that how can we systematically and reliably exploit social data for urban analytics? Um, this is a little bit of a problem if uh, you want to ask this question, so to answer this question using uh, the data that we typically deal with. And the reason is because uh, they have a strange mixture of uh, quality, spatial and temporal resolution, uh, biases, they make them uh, either suitable or not for usage. I, I summarize this into these slides typically. So if you put yourself in the shoes of um, you know, a, a urban stakeholder like the municipality or an urban designer or whatever, then you really have this continuous of tool when it comes to data gathering and interpretation. So you have a traditional urban data that comes from uh, census records, demographic uh, statistics, very precise, very well collected, but uh, not really scalable in terms of temporal distribution because you can have them once a year eventually. So in a really dynamically evolving environment like a city, that's too slow. The moment you have the data, it's already passé. You, you, you don't need it anymore. Uh, so it's low refresh rate, uh, costly of course, and also non-scalable. In the meanwhile, you have uh, other sources of data like uh, sensors in the roads or mobile phone data. Those are really, uh, they have a high spatial and temporal density sometimes. No? Uh, they have no semantics at all because what you measure are car passing by or people making phone calls from A to B, anonymized most of the time. Mm? So there are things that you can explain eventually. We did experiments with that. But again, they are mostly proprietary, so either you pay a lot of money for them or you don't have them. Uh, sometimes they're even very expensive to deploy at city scale. So we're talking every day with the municipalities in the Netherlands that they have quite a budget for stuff, uh, to buy stuff and to do nice experiments. So however, they all tell you it's uh, economically infeasible for us to put a sensor in every light pole, like they would like to, right now at least. So there is no chance in the next five years at least that we're going to have this sort of computation, well, sensing capabilities on the whole city. It's just too expensive. In the end of the spectrum, we have social web data. Huh? So social media, for instance, uh, the data from uh, geolocalized platform and so on and so forth, which is also the typical tool that many people use uh, when we want to somehow have uh, a low cost, uh, high frequency, good spatial uh, density data source. But of course, you know what is the problem with those data. They are noisy, they have strong biases. The moment you start to try to interpret the city phenomenon through social media, like Twitter, for instance, uh, and you really dig into that, you start to understand what you observe is not really the population of the city, it's a segment. In Twitter, you're talking about a 40 years old male <coughs> tweeting from home, for instance. There are many categories of the population are not represented. The same is for, is for Instagram. They're just uh, typically teenage girl. So if you want to study the city through that data, you need to understand that bias and eventually compensate for that. And of course, you see why the human component is important. Uh, you need to develop methods in order, for instance, to understand the demographic of people tweeting in, uh, in, uh, in Twitter or posting on Instagram. So the first th thing that we did, uh, first of all, wa was to enable ourselves. Of course, there is a good uh, state of the art in terms of uh, social media analysis. We didn't want to reinvent the wheel, but we wanted to have uh, a tool, an, an infrastructure that allowed us to uh, provide this type of insights in real time and to configure it uh, in such a way that according to the need that you had uh, at hand, you could use them. So one example I will tell you in one minute is for crowd management, for instance, uh, but can also be for tourist monitoring, tourism monitoring, uh, municipality that wants to understand exactly the dynamic of tourists in the city and in a place like Amsterdam, for instance, is really an issue. So they have this nice concept of uh, city pressure points. So the places in the city where tourists and residents get together and create tension because, you know, they need to coexist. And they want to have this sort of understanding uh, in a really real-time way in order to intervene and compensate for that. Uh, and yeah, for doing that, of course, there are many, many different uh, and interesting issues, actually, like integration of different urban data, the classical one and the social media one, real-time analysis, cross-sourcing your computation also that will come. So the experiment that we were doing, uh, and this is also an invitation for you for collaboration, ended on, uh, on Sunday. So we had uh, this, uh, I think is the largest, largest public uh, sailing event in the world. It was hosted in the uh, harbor of Amsterdam. Uh, it attracted, uh, uh, I think, a couple of, one, one at least 1.5 uh, million of people in, the in five days uh, into an area that was 
pretty much, I don't know exactly in square kilometers, but the main route here is six kilometer. And I was there, I can tell you, it was crowded. Uh, the, the, the point there, that the use case that we had is, was to s create new tools to support uh, um, the, the control room into understanding where potential problem might happen and also eventually why. Mm? So imagine those people to be into a room with many screens, many, many cameras to look at, and then they need to spot potential mm, uh, criti uh, critical situations, then intervene. Mm? So we wanted uh, uh, to offer them a tool to do that in automa automatically. So we partnered up, uh, actually it was a collaboration between the municipality, ourselves, uh, and uh, the, the traffic transport department in Delft, and we set it up a nice, uh, I think, first of its kind uh, in the world experiment, uh, where we deployed uh, uh, a many different uh, measuring points in here. We deployed uh, counting cameras, uh, pointing the two directions of the road to see how many people flow in one direction and the other, to estimate density in a given area. Uh, and there were like eight of them in uh, strategic places. Uh, we put there also Wi-Fi sensors and Bluetooth sensors to have uh, maybe low precision but uh, higher density and also less expensive uh, sensing technology to count how many people with a device active pass by. Uh, <coughs> and uh, we had, uh, I think, 100 GPS uh, sensors uh, that we randomly distributed to visitors uh, going in the area to see, you know, like how fast they work, where do they go, and so on and so forth. Uh, social media, uh, that this is what we were also looking at. Uh, aerial picture, so from a balloon above to see where actually the crowd visually was. And of course, all the footage of the cameras. But also something uh, is a big data set that we collected. We ended collecting uh, Saturday night at midnight, and now we are still processing, of course. Uh, but uh, the kind of answer we want to answer, we want to, to to find an answer for, are actually those. So, what measure can I apply to manage the crowd, which is uh, and which effect, uh, uh, which uh, uh, measures provide which effect, uh, informed by data coming from those sensing. So, how many people are in a given area? So, which are those people? Where are they coming from? Are they residents? Are they tourists? Uh, are they well-intentioned people or not eventually? Uh, also for security. Uh, which route do they take? So what is the most likely route for a given category of people in order that they can inform the management of the crowd and say, no, okay, now stop from here, you go in that direction because it's too busy there. Uh, how long do they stay in the area and so on and so forth. So. We developed two things. So this is, uh, of course, it was the, 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 the technical infrastructure. So all those uh, sensing in place. Uh, and for ourselves, we, uh, we also developed some sort of real-time analytics, uh, continuously looking at all those sources and putting them together to show them into some sort of report. Uh, we weren't really double-checking the data by them because it was really in real-time. That's something that they're going to do right now to see how the data is, uh, is good and uh, which is a systematic bias, if there is one, between different sensing sources. Granted that one is precise and the other can connect as a ground truth and the other can uh, be compared. And, uh, and in, in this way, you know, uh, build statistics about all of that. And also, for instance, <laughs> this is a little bit of an anecdote, but um, um, uh, to see which are the places that are more somehow popular for the type of activity you want to have. So the anecdote is the following. Um, Cameras uh, and, uh, and, uh, and 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 Wi-Fi sensors can tell you people staying still or moving, according to you know following the path. You can so know if someone is moving or if he's still in the same place. Uh, social media data, well, you know, uh, people need uh, to, to 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 tweet and do stuff. So we were trying to to use uh, methods to uh, geolocate uh, tweet posts and Instagram posts not only because they had already geolocation metadata, but because of the content. So basically textual tweets uh, to be geomapped uh, to the most likely location where they were produced. Hmm? So it's a little bit of a, a language model technique that we apply, a simple one because we want it to be run in real time, but uh, we tried. And so what came out uh, is that the most popular places, if you look at social media, were actually toilets. Now, they weren't really toilets, but there were people tweeting in the area of toilets, which is one of the points of interest of the organization, one of the ones that for them was important to monitor. And why is that? Well, it might be that we were actually in the toilet. Okay, maybe not. Uh, it can be that actually they were queuing, and uh, you do tweet uh, and, pr and, 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 uh, and send posts uh, in Instagram when you're not walking, especially if it's really crowded. 
and also because those places were actually in the crucial part of the area, so everybody was passing through them. So you have there, you go there, you stand still, you have to wait five minutes in your turn, you do something. And so the interesting uh, insights that we got is, is a really quick one. We didn't have the time to process anything. Actually, this is really open sky research we have in front of us right now. Uh, we learned that, of course, uh, a little bit intuitively, maybe social media data are more interesting to characterize people standing still than people moving. And so the complementarity of the two, the, the, the movement data and the social media data can actually tell you a lot. Like, okay, I'm here, I want to go there. And you can try to use this sort of uh, 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 fleeble signal to give an interpretation of what you observe blindly from the other data. And yeah, we have uh, very, very many research questions to work on right now. So, okay, so first of all, compare all this data against physical measurements. Uh, also counting cameras are not precise, they are up to 95%, but they don't give you, for instance, a demographic characterization of the people. So there might be a nice work for, you know, uh, smart uh, human computation methodology to look at all the streams from the cameras to try to infer that, uh, given also the camera doesn't look people in the face for privacy reasons, but they do it like from, from above, they just hit your head. Uh, text venue based venue mapping, uh, so the visual material, so all the demographic and context based analysis of the social activities to see if there is some pattern emerging and so on and so forth. And uh, of course, uh, and this is the most challenging one, but it's also the one that I like the most, uh, if you can actually use social media for this new application that is pedestrian floor monitoring and prediction, can we use this really scarce information to actually predict such a you know, <coughs> massive uh, uh, event? Any questions about this? This is also the one that is more fresh in my head because uh, it was you know, up until midnight on Sunday to, to, to do stuff. So <laughs> uh, then there is the other side of the, uh, of the problem. So when you don't have data, what do you do? You do have sensors all around in the city. Those are the people, right? So what if you actually use them as sensors so you do crowd sensing, but you get on demand? So you have an information need that you know your data doesn't, so doesn't fulfill, do not fulfill, and then you want uh, to ask people to give you information. So one example that they are doing an experiment right now in Rotterdam is for uh, um, environmental reason. So uh, uh, we do have sensors from, from, from meteorology, so uh, you know where it rains in the city, we have radar, but uh, sometimes uh, the local effect of global phenomenon cannot be measured. So which streets are going to be flooded because of contextual information you don't know. But it's really important, of course, for many different stakeholders because they want to intervene beforehand. So what if you can actually, on demand, uh, uh, talk to people and ask them to give you a measurement of uh, what's the situation? So the, the scientific and the computer science challenge here is to develop models of people uh, and also models of engagement such that you can have this process. You don't want to, pe to pick everybody's brain all the time. You don't just want to do it in the right moment. You don't want to pick uh, the brains of everybody, just of the right people. Mm? So y again, you see modeling, uh, task modeling, and then it's routing again in there. So this is an experiment uh, right now where we are developing uh, a, a mobile application sort of things, and we also be starting having real world experiments to also gather data and try to see if this can be, can be enacted. So closing the loop, this is also important. It's not only reading people's behavior, but under using this data to actually engage people and then bring data back. The, the second research problem instead is, uh, is uh, 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 within, within IBM, and this is what we call uh, the Inclusive Enterprise Project. It's also a project that we, we started uh, uh, one year and a half ago, it's already, well, which is little time in IBM time timing, that they are a slow company. Um, but we already have really good results. And the idea is really simple. Um, people are, are unhappy at work. Hmm? So there are many statistics that say that people are disengaged with their workplace, uh, they don't like where they're working, and in, uh, in companies uh, with a high technology profile, it's even more difficult to find people to work for you, so you want to retain them. So how can you do that? Um, I just, well, while I was in vacation uh, a few weeks ago. So I was reading this uh, new book uh, uh, from uh, uh, Laszlo Bock, uh, just to confirm uh, the, the intuition we had, but he's the, the, the HR manager in Google, so he's the guy in charge of people operations, as they call them in Google, and he was explaining more or less how they do HR in Google. And um, he, he shows how uh, a really <coughs> open uh, and transparent attitude combined with a nice, uh, data generation interpretation 
um, activities can actually help a lot in pinpointing this stress, pinpointing this engagement, and then take comp con, uh, compensatory actions. So he of course he claims that uh, it's not really for, 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 for monitoring people to fire them, it's just to pick problems because they before they occur and then do something about it. So they do it, uh, of course, with the data that they have, like uh, 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 they do code analysis extensively to see if developers are actually developing and being up to the standard that they have. Uh, they you have uh, questionnaires that they systematically provide to people in order to understand whether they are happy or not and so on and so forth. So but the idea is to, as again, openness and data driven. And uh, this inclusive enterprise project that we have having there, we were also mentioning it to the in the Wall Street Journal a couple one month ago, which is was a little bit weird. Uh, so the idea is, can we use social data from the enterprise to understand and influence well-being, motivation, and inclusion in the workforce? Inclusion here is the key word. It's actually taking everybody into account and be valued. It's not uh, just uh, having a subset of uh, you know more influential, more uh, visible population. It's just really everybody. And uh, one of the reactions that I have when I, I talk about this is uh, the classical uh, you know, big brother privacy type of thing. That is, okay, yeah, but you cannot monitor people. Now, one of the key factors in here, as I said, is transparency and openness. And uh, the principles under which we operate is the do not harm principle. So it's really opt-in by default. Uh, we are developing right now a pretty sophisticated system in order to make sure that uh, uh, the, the, the provenance and the usage of the data is uh, explicitly authorized down to the bottom by the employee so that the employee always know wi wi who is using the data and then needs to authorize that. Uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, something like that wouldn't work uh, if employees weren't prone to actually contribute. And so we, we, we really push in that button to make sure that everybody understand it is not for controlling them, but for making their life easy. So we're developing a system here. Okay, again, it's a combination between physical sensing and, and, uh, and uh, well other type of sensing coming from enterprise social media, for instance, or from uh, other sort of communication activities uh, undergoing in the, in the company. We also want to have uh, uh, sensors in place. Uh, we want to try to experiment uh, um, with techniques of enterprise crowdsourcing to engage people in into eliciting what they know about the company and uh, what they know about the workplace such that some information actually can be taken into account as early as possible. I have a slide about that uh, later. And uh, and it's becoming really in really interesting line of research. First of all, because IBM is, well, I think one of the biggest companies in the world, they have uh, 400,000 employees, uh, so they have quite some data about uh, their workforce. Uh, and it's also one of the most diverse in terms of uh, uh, um, age, uh, provenance of people. They really, they really have a diverse population. And so it was a really perfect case study for the type of research that we like to do. Uh, and at first, the uh, nice results that we had, uh, it was a really simple one. There, there was a master's thesis from a from student. We, we, we engaged with some of the employees in the company. I think they were... 200 or so, and uh, we asked them to provide us access to their enterprise social network data and their public social network data, so something like uh, LinkedIn. And the purpose was to see and to understand to which extent uh, those two are complementary. So is this companies in general, they don't know their employee. Eh? So the, the bigger the company, the less they know about the single employee. So how much of the information about the expertise, uh, the connections, the relationship that exists between employees known by the company unknown actually can be taken from the outside and so we made a nice study in here and uh, and we discovered several interesting uh, properties of this kind of integration of data so you see for instance that uh, the different nature of the social media brings this different uh, um, manifestation of the activity and the expertise of the employee so internally of course they want to be found because of uh, uh, for whom they're working for and the type of technical skill they have but on the outside they want, of course, to be hired, and so they want to, to, to have networks and connections. And the amount of latent relationships, uh, internal and external to the company that we found, was striking. Actually, this is somehow our, our key to the work, because HR was so happy to, 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 to see this kind of, uh, uh, of outcome that, uh, well, they basically gave us the, the goal for, for doing other activities. Another one, another experiment uh, that we, we just did, uh, it will just accept the CSCW for, for next year, is an experiment in enterprise gamification. So I, I ask you the big favor and forget a little bit about the buzzword gamification. So it's not really uh, just about uh, in, you know, uh, um, applying game mechanics in not gaming context, but it's more about uh, understanding uh, 
which type of incentives best suit a given type of business need. So what we tested there were two business needs, something that was re were really perceived as important by the company. One was uh, um, um, uh, learning, so people to learn about the company, to learn about the technology, and to learn about their peers, uh, and the uh, socialness, so the idea to spread out and to get in contact with other people, uh, with, with other employees again. And then what we were testing, uh, and the plan is, the long-term plan is to test different type of incentives from, uh, uh, you know, internal motivation, like a mission, to, to empowerment, uh, uh, to socialness in general, ownership, uh, uh, achievement, uh, um, uh, randomness, so serendipity. There are many different type of in uh, incentives that can work. And what we did here was to try to test uh, if uh, in a specific environment with uh, the... Uh, 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 um uh, an, uh, an application that we designed for the purpose and deployed for the purpose, uh, different type of uh, ownership and achievement incentives like leaderboard and, uh, and, and badges uh, uh, and, and score system can actually have an effect in how, people, how much people want to learn and how much they want to, to connect. And the differences that we saw there were actually pretty striking. So if you give an excuse for people, for instance, to connect with someone else, into the enterprise social network or into the external one, then, uh, so for instance, you, you allow them to uh, have a different type of games, then uh, this new game is also engaging for them because they can, for instance, that was a Q&A game, so do you know that uh, your colleague, uh, so which is the current position of your colleague? Manager responsible for, uh, so they learn about the, the, the company, they learn about the environment uh, and the incentive was good in order to enable them. And uh, since uh, the thing was funny and it was also useful, that's also very important, they played a lot. So in the paper we also have a nice graph, I don't know why I didn't put it here. So if we compare the retention curve uh, of the game that we had here with the ones of traditional uh, uh, game with a purpose like the ESP game uh, or, uh, or, or others, uh, it's actually pre it's pretty better. So in those games people play a lot in the beginning and then they just drop out, while in this experiment uh, those people played a lot and for longer on average. So the question that was, okay, can we use this in enterprise uh, uh, environment? Yes. And now, well, of course, we want to move, uh, to move forward. So what we want to do, so what we have uh, right now, uh, we are going to they kindly allow us to deploy a sort of a sensing uh, uh, infrastructure into one floor of their building. So there will be, I think, 40 or 50 employees in there. And we want to combine, f again, physical sensing with social sensing and enterprise crowdsourcing in order again to get more information about the employees, more information about the environment, uh, and ultimately finding new methods to actually make them feel better about uh, the workplace. <coughs> A really trivial example. So imagine that somehow we are able to understand uh, the, the mood uh, or, or the moment of a person and when, when he, he or she enters the building, we can suggest the best place to go. Right? So today you're not really in a good mood, uh, you should go in a, a loan office and we reserve it for you. Mm -hmm. So sort of a personal assistant in order to make you feel better at work. It's a trivial example, but uh, I think it makes the, the point. Okay, um, the last one is, uh, okay, so what they call, sorry, one back. Okay, so what we call uh, crowd knowledge generation and acceleration. So. And again, let me give an example of what I have in what, what I mean with that. So imagine that you have, uh, you want to rebuild Wikipedia from scratch uh, better and faster. How would you do that? So what if you want to fill in a knowledge base somehow and you want to just uh, make it uh, happen, but uh, in a on-demand, in a proactive way? So this is the type of research we do there. And uh, to, to answer this question, so how can we control and accelerate knowledge, knowledge creation at scale? Uh, again, we were driven by, by two uh, use cases in the beginning, but of course we're going to work on more. So one was uh, for uh, uh, cultural heritage content annotation. So, uh, and the other one is for a question answering system. Let me do things uh, in the right order. So we focused on uh, Stack Overflow that I think uh, uh, everybody knows here. Right, and uh, what we wanted to see there I was if uh, uh, what we were observing in terms of people behavior was uh, a reflection of uh, a genuine understanding of the topics at hand, and not uh, a reaction to the gamification system in place. 
So you know that in Stack Overflow you have uh, points, badges, and everything in there, right? And then um, it works. Uh, there is a nice paper from 2013 from uh, from you Anderson, Leskovitz, and on that say that it works. People really are driven by those badges. But uh, does activity equal to expertise? So in a system like that, uh, Stack Overflow is really about creating a knowledge base for programmers. It's not really a Q and A like you answer. Uh, so driven by this information. Can you really tell activeness apart from expertise in order that if, if you want someone to answer a question, you actually understand that the person that answers is really knowledgeable about the topic and is not really just driven by getting the next badge. And if you look uh, at the, 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 the existing work, everybody's using uh, metrics that uh, are actually driven by activeness. All the metrics that are used in order to measure expertise in these environments that are really highly correlated with activeness. And so what we wanted to kind of get was a new expertise metric, uh, something that actually was able to, you know, this is a measure of debatableness, so how much a question is debated uh, in the Stack Overflow, and this is uh, a measure of the answer quality, so how much the, the answer rank in the, uh, in the list of answers. So really wanted to get uh, not the active people, but actually the one that somehow provide the better answers uh, to the most debated question, that in our understanding is, okay, the ones that actually emerge from the noise uh, to be the, the, the best answerers. And so we actually did, it was a nice uh, paper that we did in 2014, so this uh, MEC metric, uh, mean expertise uh, uh, contribution, I think we, we call it, um, to, to, to actually tell uh, uh, those highly active users, uh, what we call in the paper uh, uh, sparrows, from uh, the expert one, what we call owls, uh, the more savvy one. And uh, by applying these, these metrics and telling those two apart, and comparing their behavior, we actually observe really striking differences between the two. There are people that are really expert that because they just don't want to get involved into silly, you know, uh, questions, they just don't answer as much as the other. And according to the metric system that they use, they just disappear. But they are there and they're very really useful. They're still active and they're really useful. Uh, then the next question that we tried to, to answer was, okay, but what about the question? So who is going to answer is an important property, but what about the question? Is there such a thing as a properly formulated question? So what makes the question good to be answered? And so we made a little bit of an analysis of the whole data set of Stack Overflow to look at the properties of answers uh, of questions that made them uh, more likely to be answered. You know, some of them uh, can be trivial, like, okay, if it is a, a question about a piece of code, you should put the code. Hmm? Um, but the others actually were pretty, pretty also pretty interesting because uh, we could then uh, uh, look at uh, the behavior of uh, Stack Overflow users to see how their average quality of questions evolved over time, to show also how they, they, they learn how to use the platform and become more uh, useful contributor for the platform itself. And then finally, this is from this year, we presented this a new app this year, uh, is uh, uh, about combining the things. So you know something more about uh, the, the, uh, the answer, you know the expertise, we also provided measure of uh, extrinsic motivation, uh, like again, activeness and intrinsic one, just the, mm, the willingness to cooperate. And we injected them into a model to see how much uh, using expertise and intrinsic motivation can actually improve uh, a recommendation problem. So can you get better performance where you inject these properties and you want to recommend uh, a given question to a potential answerer? And we observed again uh, uh, significantly different results. Uh, maybe in percentage, not a lot, in terms of absolute uh, uh, numbers, but in terms of uh, how many questions could have been uh, better or more quickly answered, this is significant. Uh, numbers sometimes alone, they don't tell you a lot. Uh, the other one, and I don't have a slide, but it will be really quick, uh, is about inside the Reich Museum. So I think you can relate more easily to, to maybe also to this one. Uh, so the Reich Museum is the biggest uh, museum in Amsterdam. They have a really big collection that they want to digitalize and annotate. The problem there is that uh, annotation takes time. It doesn't have the resources. Uh, so it's not only annotating uh, easy things in the print, like uh, the, the easy, uh, like the author or the, 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 the when it was created and so on and so forth. But since they are a public institution and they have the mandate to open up their collection, they also want to make sure that they are able to uh, be useful for a little bit uh, unforeseen use cases. So imagine you have an ornithologist that they want to understand uh, when a given species uh, of, uh, of a given bird has been introduced in Europe uh, and he wants to understand that through art, to see when a given bird starts to appear into the, 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 the popular artwork. 
In order to do that, you need to annotate the print with the species of the bird. And this is uh, knowledge intensive, well this is really a high level knowledge. You cannot ask a generic crowd to do it. You need to, to actually engage uh, uh, an expert crowd. And so the, the, the project there is actually was about uh, finding expertise in the wild, where in the wild, I mean, again, Twitter, Reddit, uh, and other platforms, engage people into contribute and look at the quality of their contribution compared with the one that every expert will provide. Mm? Uh, some of these work has been published, some of the other work uh, is still uh, ongoing. Right now, for instance, we have an experiment ongoing to try to see which way of approaching people on Reddit uh, is more likely to bring them in for contribution. So sending messages to people on Reddit uh, by highlighting or not uh, uh, their expertise in a given topic, if this is more likely or not to become uh, a factor of engagement for them. Mm -hmm. This is something that is going on right now. And uh, we're going to do next. Oh, no, I had the slides, but uh, yeah, okay, I will talk about it. So in terms of takeaway, this is the part that uh, somehow summarizes the experiment that we are doing. Uh, the, the things that uh, somehow I, well, learn in these five years working on these problems, more or less, uh, are basically three. So when you want to deal with social data, regardless of the application, you really have to understand people. And our understanding might also bring you outside of your comfort zone. May actually bring you, you know, into social sciences in a way. It may actually bring you into the problem of developing tools uh, that are able to understand properties of people that are not self-evident from the data. So, trivial example. If you assume that personality, and I think you might agree, plays a role in the way that you play a game, you know, the classical model of players, blah, blah, blah. So how do you measure the personality of someone when what you have is not a one hour long questionnaire, but just on text? Of course, there are methods to infer the personality of someone using the five, uh, the big five method. Uh, but again, that is one example. There are many others. So how can you measure the attitude of someone for risk or not? How do you measure if someone is more or less uh, pleased by surprise or not. Uh, we are in the tool of building a computation system, right? So uh, the, the, the bridge is between uh, the theories that exist and uh, our ability to create tools to apply those theory and eventually verify them with the type of data that we can produce or eventually complement where we don't have that. Uh, the second lesson that I learned is about the domain specificity. So it's really important in order to understand the data and the people that you partner up with uh, the application domain that you're working with. So it would be strange uh, to, 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 to make experiments you know, with ornithologists, uh, with, with uh, uh, annotating birth, if you don't understand from ornithologists what is the most likely way for someone to uh, uh, describe a given bird. Uh, it's strange to do studies on urban, uh, 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 urban environments if you don't partner up with architects or urban studies uh, scientists. They give you the key in order to understand, and then it's our goal to provide and create the tools that actually allows this understanding, allows to make sense, and then again to create better systems. And then the third one is get out of the lab. So maybe this is my uh, engineering background uh, and, you know, little guy playing with Lego thing, but uh, it's, really like it's really important to go outside and test and do things on the field. You need to, to get in touch with people, you need to get in touch with systems, you need to understand their properties. This is what allows you to, again, get the better insights from the data that you're going to use afterwards in your application, and also from your tool, eh? also for your tool. Okay, uh, I think I can stop here for, for today. Uh, thank you very much.